absolutely uh, fascinating talks, or three actually, three <laughs> uh, great talks, and I'm still um, yeah, processing, processing of uh, uh, what, we, what we've seen and, and heard. Um, and I was especially interested, or uh, what I found especially fascinating were your, uh, everyone's reflections on educational spaces as, as shelter, but uh, as opposed to enclosure or walling in these, uh, these educational spaces. Um, and about the discussions, uh, both in Ola's talk and, and your talks, about how, uh, yeah, how to define and conceptualize a shelter and how to actually uh, provide shelter to children and, and educators um, with the available means. Um, and this, clearly, it also revolves what, what is defined as progressive or desirable for educational spaces. So in uh, Ola's, uh, Ola's presentation, um, the idea of uh, open space uh, or using open spaces and different types of, of, of sheltering from, uh, from rain or sun uh, were uh, kind of seen as something that, that is not not so progressive, maybe, maybe not so desirable, but then again, can this be turned around and turned into something that is even more, uh, uh, yeah, um, more desirable than that, that solid schoolhouse uh, imaginary. Um, and in your talks also, there was a, yeah, you discussed a little bit, or maybe not so explicitly discussed it, but the uneasy relations, let's say, um, that I found in talking about uh, traditional knowledge about forests in some way and defining anyway the forest as our friend, something that is able to produce a new and progressive type of knowledge that will enable uh, people to thrive uh, in the forest, of the, of, of the forest, but still, uh, um, yeah, still with kind of definitions of backwardness and uh, sort of defining certain things of the past as something that is not to be picked up as a tradition to, to, to build on or a type of knowledge to build on. I'm not sure if that's uh, very clear, but I would be interested to ask uh, both Ola and, and, and you to reflect a little bit more along these lines on these ideas of shelters before I, I open, open up for some questions from the audience. Um, well, I can start then, since I've been... I mean, I think, yes, the, I, I really like the other two papers as well. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. But, I mean, I think the issue is also the semantics of what the outside is, because it's interesting. It's certainly in the English language, you talk about the jungle. It's pejorative. You talk about the forest, it's got much more progressive relationships and I wonder whether as they were pointing out oftentimes for the African psyche you're moving out of the forest or jungle to um, development and so on and I think what's really interesting about Cabral is he's sort of saying you know there's a lot to be gained from the forest uh, or the jungle and indeed um, you shouldn't be afraid of it it actually very much supports us and um develops you, which actually is the narrative that we're talking about today when we're all talking about sustainability and using local materials. But I think certainly, um, indeed, if I go back to kind of educational history, and it's interesting because obviously the whole of the coastal West Africa was colonized by the Portuguese as well. So Lagos is actually a Portuguese name. We have Rio de Sombrero, all sorts of um, escravos and so on, they're linked both to the slave trade, but also Portuguese colonization. But the idea was always that you left the, well, the village is the way we look at it, to the town, which was the new, uh, the new development. And indeed, that's where the education was. So even the missionaries would sort of often separate themselves from the traditional um, neighborhoods and build their own mission compound. So I think that link to going back to the, like back to our roots is very important. Uh, and I think maybe in my uh, paper, the issue is that I guess intellectually certain groups are more willing to begin to 
relink to the outdoors than the traditional feeling, which is close away the problems of the outdoors and stay indoors, which is more developmentally uh, sanitized. So it's a really interesting tension, is what I'm saying. So uh, thinking about the idea of the, the shelter, um, if, if I want to expand the idea of the shelter a little bit more, uh, or at least in the concept of uh, PIGC and militant education, the school becomes a shelter, not just a shelter, a shelter as a, a place where I'm studying, but what I'm studying, it became a shelter of, of, of what is going on in the world and how it's preparing me to come out of this shelter. To, to the world. For example, um, nowadays uh, on, on the school manuals we study uh, colonialism, imperialism and so on has terms that doesn't really affect our lives. And at the time of PAGC, it's so progressive, there's like this is part of our lives, this is the ongoing project, an ongoing process that is going to affect us uh, daily, especially when we achieve uh, independence, because we have to understand the liberation struggle in two, in two aspects, the independence of the country and the liberation of the men. So the school becomes this shelter for, uh, the shelter for protection of what is coming uh, of the outside, but also a shelter that prepares you to the outside of thinking about the world in, in, the, in, in the future. Absolutely, and I think to add to, to this thought, I mean, two things. One is uh, also, the, I mean, the mangroves are also the, the, the places, the natural, the natural shelters for many species. Most of the species of fishes and oysters that ha that live in these areas, they they put their eggs in in the in the in in the mangrove uh, roots. And actually, it's the place where you know big fish cannot um, uh, you know access, and it it creates a uh, a chaotic uh, you know labyrinth ne ne network that that actually is a creates this protection. At the same time, parallel to that, I mean, we have been talking with many of our uh, co colleagues and kins, <laughs> as we say, our comrades, uh, because we've been working for so long uh, now on, on these uh, issues. And we have been discussing also this, the importance of, even today, creating safe, these kind of safe spaces. Because, for example, in, in Guinea-Bissau, uh, where we are working a lot is uh, th there are uh, si the situ for example the neocolonial or the neoliberal pressure for example in the, in the youth is so um, intense that people are not they don't have any more um, the capacity of reflecting what is actually happening yeah, with them the is that so so once you create these kind of spaces you know this kind of like Spaces where you gather and you start reflecting. You know what? You know what are the the the, the, the tourist operators doing, or the you know the oil uh, the exploitation. And when you or the politicians or their conditions of life that is completely out of place. When you create spaces where people can reflect and uh, discuss together and put the subjects on the table, and you know, like t when you create these spaces, it's it's a way of like protection. And and I think. In the, we can extrapolate it directly, I think, because you know the struggle is not over yet, and the war is go, goes on. So the, if you extrapolate it to you know what's happening now in in the wars of today and 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 in that time, you know, like creating a space where children could you know like read, think, discuss together, in the context of a permanent stressful adrenaline loaded um, condition of life. Um, it's it's in, it, it, it's yeah it's a super important moment of uh, creating your own subjectivity. subjectivity. Thanks. Um, questions from the from the audience. I'm actually blinded by. <laughs> There's Tom. <laughs> Uh, I have a question to Ola. Hi, it's Tom. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, I was I was uh, uh, struck by one thing you said uh, at the pretty early on in your talk uh, about the um, the the way in which the more experimental kinds of uh, 
spatial design and uh, pedagogies uh, are being distributed only, I mean, uh, uh, among, the, uh, among the bourgeois uh, expat uh, scene in uh, Nigeria and Ghana and West Africa at the time, uh, how, because you're bringing in the, the notion of class here, or the, or the, or the, uh, the, the concept of class, which is, which is, of course, in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, case, very closely related to the question of colonialism and, uh, and uh, the way in which class is being uh, kind of, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a there, there are class boundaries within the colonized uh, population, but there's also the class difference between the colonizers and the, and the colonized. And how this is kind of playing out in the very uh, designs of, uh, of, of, uh, of schooling and of school buildings uh, is, could you say, um, maybe elaborate on that uh, a bit? Because this, I think, is a crucial aspect we haven't, uh, we haven't touched okay. upon yet. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do so. I think, I mean, it is very interesting that originally the um, col col colonists came in, as I said, from the missionary times right up until the 1960s, where particularly in British-speaking West Africa, King's College Lagos was very much the kind of Eton stereotype. It had the building, it had the facade. You could say the same thing about Achimota College. So these were the government colleges, but even the missionary colleges they're very much built in the image of um, European colleges of the time. Um, and you have this situation where post-independence, I think very much the case that, I think for the average Nigerian or Ghanaian, that was what they aspired to. But in a way, intellectually, the discussion begins to develop further, particularly, actually, originally in the universities. So you have actually a new breed even of British architects. Fry and Drew and Co. were much younger architects than the colonial architects of the time. And they bring in an international style. So you're sort of seeing that international style playing its way through in the international school I showed you as a case study. And then interestingly, we have other actors. So we have Sharon coming in from Israel to help build the third university in Nigeria, the University of Ife. I mean, there's a whole set of politics around how Israel, at a time when Nigeria was allegedly in the Cold War and much more aligned with the Arab states than with the Israelis. But anyway, Sharon comes to build the University of Ife. It's a very interesting interpretation of, I would almost say, brutal modernism, late modernism. He's very much looking at environment and climate, but he's also beginning to, again, experiment with space. Um, so unlike even um, the University of Ibadan, which is about 10 years earlier, he's much more into experimenting with spaces in terms of indoor, outdoor, using the climate more. But again, the universities were for the elite. Um, your average person who's trying to get his son or daughter to school thinks of a school as being this space that is bounded, the setting is the setting that they can remember really probably from missionary days. And it continues now because when I was writing my book, I could plug the book, I can't find it. Um, the, you could, um, if you look at the Aga Khan schools, Aga Khan colleges in East Africa mainly, they have a lot of use of outdoor auditoria. They begin to talk. I'm thinking particularly about the Aga, Aga Khan College in Mombasa. It really links to the old Swahili architecture and so on. But to get into the Aga Khan school in Mombasa, I did actually ask. The majority are, again, expatriates, upper middle class. I think they have one or two scholarships for the poor. So again, intellectually, in terms of class, it's still that development of a neoliberal viewpoint of education that is much more experimental, that a certain group of um, Africans now uh, are more interested in. But the average African is still looking at schools very much as, it was, as they were delivered, actually, prior to independence. And there's also a reliance on these materials, which are not sustainable, which is the other narrative, so neither the education nor the materials are really moving with the times. Thank you. 
Please, Sabine. Sabine, better. Hi. Uh, thanks for that really great presentation. Um, I have a quick question to uh, Sonia and Filippa um, about the title of your project called Militant Education. So I was wondering if you refer with this also to like militant research, or maybe if so, if you also could talk a little bit about the, the way, the, the process of how you make this film. That would be very interesting. I'll start with the, with the first one, uh, first question about militant. Militant education, actually, the title uh, was uh, found, is, is, it was the name of a seminar or a discipline for students from the, sec, the first and second grade of, uh, on PISC uh, school program. Um, and that was the, what gave origin to the name of, of, of the book before uh, even mentioned about uh, militant uh, research. Uh, it uh, has, as an activist, uh, and as a political, social political activist, my work was always militant, but I never, I was not expecting during my research to find the term militant education so clearly ex like so explicit in a school manual, like today we won't talk about that. Uh, when I mention about militant education, we are talking about political education, uh, not like how we understand it today, like you become some part of a, a terrorist group or so. It's a political education that we are talking about, uh, anti-colonial and decolonial education. And this was work that I was already doing uh, before I start my PhD. And uh, I was very surprised to find this on the on the on the on the archives research, and I decided to use the, to give the, the title of the uh, of the book, uh, the first title, "Militant uh, Education: Liberation Struggles and Consciousness." Actually, you can read in uh, on the opposite way: it was consciousness, uh, liberation struggle, and then militant education. That is a whole process. So, um, yeah, concerning the militant education, is uh, that's it. You want to, to answer the second one about the title of the film? Um, we, have, we only have a working or title. A working title. <laughs> I mean, I think one, one aspect is maybe because we see our work uh, like in, in a certain condition that is not a, uh, it's not a post-colonial condition, it's a colonial or a neo-colonial condition that I think it, it makes it a bit different that the work that we do is not just historicizing you know, the past, but it's actually about getting tools to struggle in the present. So, and this is important because we don't think, you know, there is such thing as the end of colonialism. So, and, and I mean, the work that Sonia has done in communities, you know, for years and, you know, passing to, you know, you're, you're changing your setting, but you're doing the same work. So it's not, um, and, and this is, uh, so it's actually trying also to work with the tools of the subjects that we are um, working about, or, or at least uh, trying to recuperate and see how can we adjust certain tools that were used and what what, it, what is still valid and useful today. Um, and for example, parallel to this work that we're doing as a, as a film, we are also creating a space there that is this, you know, with our collective, uh, that is a space exactly, that it's going to be a non, you know, it's not going to be connected with the PHC because today's PHC is, it, it's a name, but it's not the same thing, but uh, but um, it's a, it's about informal, edu it's an informal educational space and a safe, what we call a safe space to, 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 to discuss and to work. Uh, and, um, I mean, I, I even have here your concept of militant education, if you want to, to read. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, I think it's, it is the one that you had in your book. But uh, con concerning, the, I mean, at the moment we have only like a working title called, called Learning from Rizofura. And the idea is not that the people were learning in the mangroves, but that we are also learning from this process, you know, with the, you know, we are learning with with the, with the research and with the film. So it's both. They were learning with the mangroves, but we are also learning with with the process. So it's it's actually the the idea of of both. Uh, and um, yeah, I, mean, 
think. And ju ju just to add uh, a little bit more of, uh, oh sorry, just to add a little bit more about the co the, pro the process of militant edu education. Um, the, the, during a work that I was doing in Portugal, uh, I was working with, with uh, students, uh, black students, uh, Afro, Afro descendants uh, students, and they were complaining about the way they were being represented in the school, and they were saying like, we don't have a history, uh, nothing appears in the school book. And it's like, no, something must, something, something must be there, something must exist. So I, I, I want to, to give them uh, another idea of what a school book could look like and it was through this, through this combination between me working and they uh, raising questions. I remember, oh, when I was doing my, my master, uh, I actually found some uh, material related with the education of, PI, of PIGC education. And that's how the project actually started. It was in a militant way of I have to give something to, to I, I have the means to present something new and something that will uh, create some uh, more self-esteem uh, on this, on these students, and it was in this militant way that I, I start this 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 project, and is in a militant way that uh, uh, me and Filippo we work uh, in everything that we've been doing in the past uh, ten years or so. There's also one little aspect that I that we didn't. I mean, I jumped actually, but it's important because I think what there is a difference between this demystifying that we were talking about the fears of the jungle and also and. The, the the animistic aspect of, of Guinea-Bissau's population and uh, in relation to nature. I mean, the and I think that it's a um, it's a it's, 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 it's sometimes it can confuse because, for example, I think also Cabral was wor I mean was working within this kind of animistic relation with nature. Uh, and also with the, you know, like even if you would call, for example, in scientific terms, for example, working from a, 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 a he talks about this edaphology. Um, you know, edaphology is like the, the one of the two uh, sides of of, of so soil, soil science, science that is actually uh, the how the soil. Um, uh, intervenes or reacts on, on the beings on it. So it's actually, a, you know, from the soil, like kind of a subjectivity from, you know, like what, uh, that comes from, from the soil up. And I think um, it's not to, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a complex element, but it's, you know, he, he, he was also talking about the, the importance of um, connecting modernity and animism, you know, like and bringing together, you know, like he, also when he when he talks about the the, the sacred entities, the Irans, you know, the, the Guinea Bissau, like uh, they talk about the Irans as these sacred entities that is, that are, are always connected with with nature and the trees and uh, and and how they were also um, um, militant, you know. Mm -hmm. So he actually create, creates this relation. He really says that the the Irans of the jungles of the of the sacred jungles they were on the side of the struggle. So in a way. And this is, there's a, I have a little quote here from Eduardo Viveros de Castro that really talks, I mean, because it's complex to, to go into this, you know, to find, you know, words and, and sentences to, to relate to this. But he, he, says, he says in a very interesting, he, say, he says like, what interests me is the possibility of reintroducing the past to the subject, which doesn't have to be dualistic, but is a materialistic theory of the subject as a material subject. So we have to, the heroic tale of humanity conquering nature, which is an alterity form from, from, the, from the point of view of culture. Culture as a modern soul, within that distinguishes us from the rest of creation. Whereas among the Amazon Indians, it is exactly the opposite. In their views, we are all in, we are, uh, we are all in the world. Humans merely have, uh, uh, merely have a, a particular materiality. What makes us human as such is our body, not our soul. Our soul is the most common thing in the world. Everything has a soul. Everything is animated. You see animism. So in a way it's actually about, and this is a little bit what we are searching through the film also, like wow, the film can be also, uh, because it's also an animated um, uh, yeah, image or uh, um, uh, um, not a being, but a, a, a device, no, something that that has its own anima, and um, and how can we find, you know, a way of 
of bringing all these forces together you know like how how can the you know the the, the mangroves become this kind of force and that animates and also um it it has a knowledge itself it emanates a certain kind of possibility of being within yeah. you know, and, and thinking within can i ask a question of course <laughs> All right, I was just wondering, so the work you're doing on Guinea-Bissau, does it link to what then becomes the movements in Southern Africa? Um, so, you know, the ANC had its own schools in exile. Uh, sometimes, I think it went right to Tanzania and then sometimes in the border of Mozambique. Or is it purely and uniquely um, for um, Guinea-Bissau and Cabo Verde? Um, I start uh, to do the work focus on, on Guinea-Bissau and right now I'm working on the concept of militant education in an international way. How can we see it, uh, for example, how can we see the extension with Mozambique, for example, that I'm working now uh, with Mozambique. And then uh, with uh, Ghana, also with the Black Panther movies, uh, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> the Black Panther Party in the U.S. and the, in, uh, the indigenous movements uh, in, in the U.S. too. So I'm trying to see how uh, the, the work of uh, Cabral and um, the, the militant education, how this, this is spread and how it relates uh, around the world and uh, South Africa too, of course. I was thinking particularly in terms of the architecture, the idea about, I guess in Nigeria we call it schools in the bush. Mm -hmm. So, for example, during the Biafran War, 1966 to 1970, uh, there were these schools for um, the refugees as they were moving as the Nigerian army was closing in on Biafra. And actually, interestingly, coastal, back to this thing about us sharing the same geography of the coast. Mm -hmm. A lot of the coastal communities would have had the schools of these mangrove areas and so on. So it's that idea about the shifting school and the transient nature of these schools that I'm particularly interested in. It, it happened also, you, you can find this kind of structures also in Zimbabwe during the second Shimurenga. So okay. the, uh, the, the, these structures uh, somehow during liberation struggles in, in Africa, they are very well, very related in terms of how they were built and how they were transferred from place to place. Um, so th this is uh, something that I'm exploring right now, uh, seeing how militant education uh, has uh, his networks on how, of how this uh, liberation struggle combines in the terms of uh, education and across, uh, not just in Africa but also across the, the ocean. Because I think, again, just discussing that a bit more, the idea about the actualization of the space and the place in comparison to now what we have, which is kind of refugee camp education, which, again, is very aid-driven, I would say. Whereas in this case, I think particularly listening to Cabral in your clip really gives you the idea that, you know, this space may not be seen as something, but it's part of the, you know, you're adding, you're including the, the situatedness of the space to the kind of education that's taking place, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, I just wanted to add something that is it's kind of a, an interesting aspect. There was a very recently um, a kind of a conference of um, uh, environmental education in in the Bijagos Islands, like an international conference, and and it, they didn't include one. Uh, Bijago people to talk about their relation to nature because the interesting thing is is um, the fact that the Bijagos, for example, that is this ethnic group that that are on the islands, they have this very particular aspect that they're they they're sac I mean they they sacralize places and nature on the uh -huh. islands as a way of protecting them. And this is actually so. The, the there's no so religion and 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 nature protection. They are they were they are always connected. They were always connected. In they are living there for the past thousand years, and and um, and it's very interesting because they actually are the ones that can tell us about. They can educate us about how to protect nature, but they are not. There's no. They are not given a voice, even if. <laughs> If the conference like that happens, is, happens yeah. there, so it's, this is actually a very interesting kind of like connecting with this idea of the aid 
and um, and what kind of um, yeah what kind of this this kind of aid concept is doing you know like and projecting to onto these places. May I add just one thing uh, related with the, what Philippa just said about the the nature uh, and with the text that I showed about the uh, the forest, our friend. Uh, this demystification that uh, PIGC is trying to do is not is is a way also to protect the forest because once you demystify the forest and you create the respect for it in the in the period of development you can have more respect and you can actually protect the 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 forest from capitalist extraction of uh, exploring it. Yeah. So we yeah. have to see yeah. it in in very different perspectives. Uh, this idea of demystification. Of, of forest and how one relates to, to nature, which was uh, what uh, PIGC was doing during this period of militant education. Respect uh, and what can you extract, but extract it, but from a, a, in a conscious way, in a conscious way. One more. Oh, okay. Um, I don't see any more hands. And I think we've had a very, very rich discussion. And uh, I thank very much Ola, Uduku, Sonia, <laughs> and uh, Lipa for these wonderful talks and, and discussion. <laughs> and everyone, uh, <clears throat> and everyone who lasted till now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Ola. Um,